In our transfer project, Embodied Histories Entangled Communities, which is just starting as a collaboration between the uh, Cluster of Excellence and the Museum Hamburger Bahnhof, we want to further explore methods and strategies of practice-based research in collaboration with a large team of people, including scholars, students, academics, artists, and other people to be involved to disseminate knowledge in new ways and explore experiential ways of tacit knowledge, which is hopefully magic and really full of joy for everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thus, our conference is setting an agenda of seven fields of hopefully far-reaching research inquiries. We would like to ask you to share your perspectives on the following questions. How can practice-based research be used as part of an open, fluid, dynamic and process-based approach towards the production of knowledge? As the Museum for Contemporary Art here in Berlin, we are opening up to partnerships with the academic world, but also with partners in other parts of the world. The conference that we are having today, Embodied Histories, is a starting point for this collaborative project, which will look into the history of performance art and the present research about performance art. We are trying to collaborate in questions of how to narrate the history of performance art, but also what does it mean for public collections to deal with performative activities? How can we present this important artistic activity to our visitors? So we started working on this project in 2017 um, and first met in Jakarta, then we met in Bangkok and in Chiang Mai. Now we're in Berlin for this conference. The process is already part of the whole project. So in the making is the product itself already. But we will of course somehow try to bring together some exhibitions, one in Berlin, one in Chiang Mai, one in Jakarta at the Galerie Nationale. But we are very much into really discussing the process and what we are talking about and recording it. This is the main part of it, our discussions. How and which histories do you embody in your performances? mother tongue, leftover is translated as tada. It's a verb, an action word. It means to leave something behind for the other. It never meant to waste. I begin this with this line from Dayao, an artist of Philippine heritage who now resides in Berlin and has built a practice around cooking. He considers cooking a process that occupies the immediate, the emergent, and the local. I am quoting him. For him, it provides, and I quote him again, a meditative space for digesting and ruminating what is emerging. With the sentiment of converging as a framework for performative toil, his projects are events that center on cooking and how it convenes in formal and oral settings, such as eating together or meeting other people for drinks and how this delineate quote, potent spaces for generating particular kinds of knowledge.
the starting point of the performance that I did at Bauhaus was silence. I wanted to reflect on the specific positionality of silence. The first here is uh, four Japanese dancers, Sarkiem, Tamina, Sukiya, and Wakiem, who performed at the Netherlands East Indies Pavilion at Paris Exposition Universal in 1889 for six months. They were the first in the, uh, Indies indigenous dancers performing outside the dust, it's Indies. They were staying for six months in Paris, created a chain of quote-unquote bronze skin dancing body from Paris literati, including painter Paul Gauguin and uh, sculptor August Rodin. So these images led me to trace, to trace and revisit some historical trajectories and to confront my own internal contra-orientalism towards Bali. For years, I consciously avoided Bali in my dance research practice, precisely because I think, I think of Bali as a fully orientalized space, which provided very little opportunity for critical intervention. What can cultural institutions learn from narrative and performative practices related to their diverse audiences? I'm interested in extended audiences because I think for cultural institutions like museums, theatres, also for academia and other cultural institutions, it's uh, important to address the increasing diversity and heterogeneity of audiences. Long time we thought of audiences of, as homogeneous and kind of solid blocks or groups and we realize that this uh, interesting temporal community of an audience is uh, a phenomenon we don't know much about and as a scholar in theater and performance studies I'm researching these audiences and also what happens with uh, audiences under the situation of globalization, of migration and of uh, new technological developments. I think it's time when we need to stop treating audience, artists, managers and everyone in different hierarchies. I think cultural institutions need to start uh, dealing with everyone that has stakes towards their institutions in equality. Where, when and why narratives circulate? What role do narrative strategies play in mediating knowledge and experience? And I think that narratives always circulate. I, I think they can't even help not circulate, or rather they can't help circulating, they will always circulate. So sometimes narratives circulate because they belong to large cycles, such as the Trojan myth or such as the Arthurian myth. And sometimes narratives circulate because they belong to popular traditions, which then become uh, turn into narrative stereotypes and only have to be referenced briefly. They turn into cliches, but those cliches can be reactivated in new contexts. So narrative can be condensed and expanded, and as it changes, it circulates because every step in the circulation means a transformation. I think the, the question of uh, circulation of narratives in general is just like really important today in, in the field of what makes our reality. In particular, as we've seen in America, rise of Trump sort of uh, partly seen as a phenomenon of the Facebook bubbles and so on. This sort of like understanding of multiple bubbles of reality and the circulation within those bubbles. In the 90s and 2000s, we had this idea of um, global narrative through like capitalism and globalization and circulation and narrative of everyone. And now with hard acceptance to realize about these sort of micro bubbles that technology and sort of different choices that we made throughout history, apart from the globalized connected network uh, through capitalism. In my work, I try to understand like different uh, kind of narratives, whether like mythological storytelling or certain specific political situations as all as stories, all as sort of like reality as layers and layers of uh, storytelling, you know, and fundamentally like how our reality or our main domain of known reality usually is written either by the state or like whoever won in those situations. That does not really 
one objective history and one objective narrative, but like to understand or to try and see the world maybe comes from sort of a synthesis or a reaching out to, to see like the layering or the sort of entanglement of different narratives. And it's often the narratives that get pushed down, narratives that kind of aren't written, like those lost ones that maybe like need the most kind of like reaching out towards. Reworking the colonial trope of the training as a harbinger of modernity, wherein what is most valorized is the speed of the training. Here, the image instead focuses on its stability, or the ability to keep something absolutely still in the midst of rapid movement. In this displacement of speed by stability, a series of counter-racializations appear to have taken place. The horror of an accelerated capitalism without limits is embodied not by the Chinese investor charging to his demise, but a European coin standing precariously on its edge. More remarkably, the same logic of racialization that conflated the Chinese with a capitalism going off the rails is applied here to reclaim it as a force that would extricate us from the ongoing crisis of capitalism. Can stereotypical patterns of hegemonic narratives be unlearned in communities in which new experiences are generated in the process. How can these artistic practices be used for the research to reach, transform, or even constitute diverse communities? We Ruang Rupa initiated an informal school, and we call it Good School. The school aims to be a platform for us together to share our experiences and knowledges for anyone who is interested in learning collectively on how to build an independent and sustainable system. We use this school as a platform to formulate, to choreograph, to codify all of the things that we have experienced over the years. What we've been doing, I can say that what is so necessary is to be able to make sure that the space to learn in an tangible way is there for people to be able to be recognized. Those who decide to play a role to nurture and to create the ecosystem so that this space will always be available is a very important role. On one hand, we are managers, networkers, and programmers who have space that run programs. While on the other hand, we are a group of artists who also have artistic practices and of course, vast variety of artistic statements. I think you can use artistic practice. We just saw like an example by the works of Gargrit, that the way he creates his own research based art project and his film, it's really kind of dig into the local mythology and narrative in the community. And he even can transfer those knowledge, even expand it and reconnect it to the other community. So it's kind of part of those complicating and uh, entangled at different communities and recreated the new ones. Thus, I'm delighted to say that today and tomorrow, we, the cluster temporal communities, will be forming a temporal community, not only with Hamburg Abanov, but with all of you present. I am certain that this briefly established community will expand and reach out, creating entanglements of its own and stretching into creative futures as yet unforeseeable. And I'm very much looking forward to that. What are practices of course temporal collective relationality and how do these challenge notions of normativity? So it's my pleasure as the next speaker to introduce David T. He's a writer and curator and researcher at the National University in Singapore who specializes in Southeast Asian contemporary art. No doubt it's awareness of that ideological nature of the contemporary that compels the demand for histories of it today. And this is why my own focus has been on theoretical accounting of the contemporaneity that belongs to this region and how it differs from others. Now at this point in my scan of the 90s, the Academy ceases to be a crucial point of reference and that inclusive category of performance needs to be revised. The relational projects of the late 90s often had a performative dimension 
though less tied to the body and typically resiling from the activism of the artist-run groups that went before. I have a question for Cosmin, and uh, because you mentioned the power of the exhibition or the power of exhibiting, and I'm interested in which way the power of the exhibition or, or of exhibiting finds an extension in the power of documentation. It is a very fragile uh, medium. It is a very fragile uh, field of operation, uh, making exhibitions and putting things together. And it's uh, very often one, one has this, uh, you know, feeling of loss, you know, of like, you know, how to, what is there to survive? And is there something that should actually like survive? Or is there maybe, you know, the idea that what I mentioned, that the power of exhibition is also like time limited, that, that this power of exhibition only really works uh, uh, in a particular moment of time. If I may sneak in into that, uh, because like, because what happened is we, we collaborated with, with Parasite also for this project called The Afterwork, which look, looks at like the production of literature among domestic migrant workers in Hong Kong. And it was kind of like it's, pub, it's basically a publication project, but then kind of develops into a bigger exhibition. What was what's interesting for me was that actually it doesn't stop there even after the project ends because like the books then went to other uh, migrant workers communities in Taiwan and then even it goes into the prison and then being discussed and it's about um, that's why I'm thinking about this idea of the afterlife of a project of uh, of a narrative. Another development that happened in that year, and that were the big marches that happened in Hong Kong against a law that the Hong Kong government was trying to pass, and this sounds all awfully familiar, uh, which was the uh, uh, security law, uh, uh, a security law that was uh, trying to be sort of uh, secretly like put on the table when you know nobody was noticing and everybody was busy with the with the, with the epidemics. How can performance art and performative artistic social practices in cultural institutions and beyond be collected, archived, exhibited, reflected on, mediated or transformed? One would imagine that um, collecting and storing um, performative practices would be very easy because of the lack of the physical form. But in fact, it is complicated by its absence, uh, by its ephemerality, and that creates interesting challenges for both collecting and also uh, looking at the ways in which to represent the work after it's already been performed. And how have the crucial turns in such histories been recorded or remembered? I wanted to distinguish the artist-initiated and self-validating groups of the period from the institutional platforms that bolstered their currency, but did so from a distance, and even when informed by research and the best of intentions, under the imprimatur of the state and subject to state agendas. I guess, so for an art historian who's sort of like invested in the life of the mind, as well as in the disembodied time warping and multiverses that is the internet, my engagement with performance is really cursory at best. And it is from the periphery that I gain an understanding of the performative, even if intended messages and fully formed ideas often get distorted by the time it reaches me. So that was my first entry point into the power of words, into the power of imagination to the power of um, creativity uh, to sort of challenge oneself into the thinking out of one's sort of like confines. We're interested in the idea of temporal communities because we think that literature fundamentally establishes relation and entanglements over time. Literature is something that is read, that is disseminated, produced, performed, in conditions of ever-changing temporality. Literature develops temporalities of its own. A text imagines how it will be received in the future. A text imagines future audiences. Future audiences are thus shaped by a text because they recognize themselves in the text that they receive and thereby kind of project back onto the text an image of their own reception and thereby change the text rec retroactively. So there's a con constant back and forth in temporality between texts, 
audiences between different art forms as a text might move from one art form to the other, actually cease to be a text, become a film, become an opera, become a whole sequence of different art forms, those will mean inevitably that the text enters into a new temporality. A novel might actually be condensed into 19 minutes of film or perhaps a short story will be expanded into something like a TV series if, you know, push comes to shove, it, if things get really, um, really aggressive. So in other words, temporality is always involved when literature transforms itself, when it changes its media, or when it addresses audiences, because these audiences reflect back on the literature they receive.